this is um, a painting that I did when I first landed in San Antonio in 1981. And it's oil just on unstretched canvas. I sold, this is my first painting I sold. And it was so much money, it paid my rent for a month. And it now it hangs in a restaurant in New Braunfels, Texas. And it is there to this day. Okay. And then <clears throat> this was a paper mache and cardboard urn that I made um, when I uh, got to San Antonio. I was 21 and I just came out as a lesbian. And um, I was trying to work some sort of gay imagery into my work and, and, and uh, in my storytelling. And so I did uh, some beautiful women on a Greek urn. And this was the, this piece got into the San Antonio Museum of Art when I was only 26 in a big group show. Okay, and then um, in 1983, um, I went to, uh, my girlfriend at the time was a is a photographer and she was uh, one of Christo's photographers for the surrounded islands in um, Biscayne Bay in Miami, Florida. And so I worked with Christo. Um, I went down there, flew down there, and um, we wrapped the islands and they dropped me off way out here on a little boat. And they told me, uh, you know how to swim, right? I said, oh yeah, but I didn't know how to swim. I just said that so I could get the job. So I had to dog paddle as fast as I could to a little rope. But, but by the end of two weeks, three weeks, I, I could dog paddle really good. And that's my paycheck. Um, and uh, we got a piece of fabric too. Okay, and then um, I, be, I started in 1989, I um, went to a, a theater company that I belonged to and I started doing performance art. And these are my cardboard cutouts of extinct animals that are extinct. And um, these are my friends that I have as um, members. Uh, John Hernandez, the Texas Gray Wolf, he, he, he passed away from AIDS. And then Tom back there, uh, the parrot, um, uh, he passed away from AIDS too. I was his main caregiver. Um, and then <clears throat> um, we're going to go now, we're going to go into the 90s. And... Um, this giant painting, five by five oil painting, was in a big group show at Blue Star in San Antonio. And um, it was sold to a law firm. And um, I drove it out there in my pickup truck and I, and I dropped it off. And they were all standing there admiring it and loving it. And they said, Lisa, Lisa, tell us the title. And I said, it's called Slip It In. And they, they looked at me like they were in shock. And I got home and they called me and told me they could not take the painting because of the title was contra was uh, censored. They said it was too bad. So I was really sad by that, but they said, we'll buy any another painting, we don't care. I said, okay. I went home and then I sold that one too. So um, then um, I, I also painted uh, houses in, um, all over San Antonio and Austin and restaurants. And, and um, I also worked for Sandra Cisneros, the writer. She lived um, a couple streets around from me and uh, she bought this painting from me, um, these two pink cabbages. And, um, and we remain friends to this day. And um, then in Texas Monthly, it's a big magazine in Texas and I was, featured with uh, eight art, Texas artists from Austin, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, and who make art that is functional. And um, I uh, made the, I, I, I was so desperate back those days to make things and sell them. I just got carpet tubes and paper mache that baby up, found old lampshades, and my friend who was in a lamp shop taught me how to wire my own lamps. I sold a ton of those. Then, um, uh, so then uh, I went to graduate school. This is a, a painting. Then I, it was getting really hot a lot, all the time. And so I just painted sprinklers and hoses. And I had a little show in uh, Los Angeles 
in uh, 2001, and this painting was featured in the LA Times for the Weekender, and I slept with it under my pillow that night. And um, this is one of the reasons that I love San Antonio so much. Uh, I lived across the street when this little house was just painted white in traditional green, and a little old man lived there with a, a big black and white cat. And I was, I, I have loved this house since I was 21 years old. And it, somebody bought it and, and they fixed it up, you know, they painted it uh, more traditional. And um, I love San Antonio because of the Mexican culture and um, the semi-tropical uh, plants. Um, and now after this, I decided to move to New York City. And um, when I got to New York City, I started painting flowers. And uh, because I was so, um, I missed, uh, I'm basically a farm girl deep down inside, country girl, and I just needed some plant life. And um, then uh, I met Louise Bourgeois and um, we, I would go to her house on Sundays for her salon and I would actually call her on the phone and ask her what time I needed to be there. I would call her and she would answer the phone. Hello? And I'd go, Louise, it's Lisa. Yes? What time should I be? There? Just be here at one o'clock and make sure you bring your painting. When you went to her salon, you had to bring a piece of artwork. So um, they, I just loved being there and they filmed us every time we went. There was probably about 10 people from all over the world and you sat with her and you talked about your work. This is the painting that I brought one time and she loved this painting. And I hope I have time for a short Louise Bourgeois story. She said, oh, Lisa, I love your background color and your, your, the, you, you, the way it glows. Why do you have that kind of an atmosphere? And I said, well, Louise, I love to, I'm very homesick in New York really and I, walk the streets and I look in people's windows and I look for light that is soothing. So that it's like a glow that makes it feel homey that I could belong. And she goes, do you use binoculars? <laughs> I said, no. She said, do, are you in a gallery? I said, no. And then I was waiting, waiting, but I never have, I just got invited back every time. So I feel very fortunate in my career that I have met Christo, I met uh, Louise Bourgeois, I worked with Deborah Butterfield, I worked with Ken Price. Um, when I was with Christo, it was just me, him, his wife, Jean-Claude, and my girlfriend in a speedboat with somebody else driving it, and we were driving through the islands. And I said, Christo, will you sign my t-shirt? He said, yes. So I have my t-shirt, my official Christo t-shirt with his signature on it. So um, then I came back to Washington and um, this is the things that influence me now are nature and uh, maybe things uh, becoming extinct. Again, that uh, theme of extinction uh, comes back up. This is some little beach property in Shelton that I saved up for that is a retreat for me. This is the par my parents' farm I inherited now, five acres. Uh, Swan Creek goes through it and Swan Creek eventually ends up in the Puyallup River. And, um, um, and we have over 350 rhododendrons planted throughout the five acres in the woods. And so from this uh, work, I uh, become more nature oriented. And these are some nature doormats that I made that I, I have fun with and, and collage and, and get just playful and um, they're done with quilting batting and I sew the edges and they're to be on the floor uh, as a doormat. And um, when they were in a show in Seattle at the Alice Gallery in Georgetown, I had them on the floor in front of the painting and people didn't even see them and they stepped on them and I got really sad, but that's what I made them for. And it's all about how when we look at nature, Sometimes we use nature as a doormat. And then um, again, the cardboard, me working with cardboard 
since 19 in the 80s. I use cardboard now as my bronze burnout so that these herring, this school of herring um, uh, actually show the cardboard. And it's, it's pretty fun because it's easy. And um, then this is a big major painting that I love that comes from um, being out in the woods. It's called Hammersley Inlet and it's uh, four feet by five feet oil. And so uh, now that I'm back here, uh, I'm having a good time. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, you can unmute yourself so I can hear the clapping. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Would you mind um, taking a few questions? Does anyone sure. have questions for I saw, Lisa? I, I, I met Andy Warhol in line two one night, 1985, in line for the Palladium. That's awesome. He stood right here and looked at me because I had the coolest outfit on. He couldn't believe it, how cute I looked. <laughs> I can believe how cute you looked, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. I had on a, you know. a red, white, and blue suede motorcycle jacket with white fringe because it was 60s night. And he just looked at my, and I had red, white, and blue uh, Willie Smith pants on, bell bottoms. And he just looked me up and down. And, and I, before he came up to in line, I heard all the kids in line go, because it's like one in the morning, there's Andy Whirl, there's Andy Whirl, there's Andy Whirl. And I went to turn to look and he was standing right here at me. And I went, oh my God. And his wig, I could see it. And um, I was taller than he was. <laughs> I want to know what you did with Slip It In. What happened to that painting? Oh, uh, when I got it back home, uh, word went around that I got censored and uh, a, a, a collector bought it. A guy named Gregory bought it. Yep. I sold it like two days later. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful painting. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, I also have a a woman that's Alice Simpkins is on board of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston and she is a patron, was a patron of mine back then, and she bought a beautiful little watercolor, almost similar to that, and it hangs next to a David Hockney. Oh, see, this is the time you get to brag a little. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lisa, what's, so what's the, I mean, no pressure, but like, what's being a full-time studio artist going to look like for you? Any ideas? Uh, yeah. I think it's going to be kind of going back to my youth when I just cooked in a restaurant at night, flipping burgers at the Beauregard and did art all day and really had artists in my blood. You know, when you're younger, in my 20s, and I just, in 30s, I worked so hard. And that in my 40s, I was teaching college in New York. And, but I, I, I just know it's going to be where I'm, uh, exploring and trying new things and you know just having a great time that's awesome are you gonna flip the burgers just for the authenticity <laughs> no. i've um, always worked in restaurants my whole life and i've always taught kids in after school uh, i have a comment um from dan my wife is in a meeting here in the room so i'm muted but lisa i love your louise bourgeois voice uh, I agree. <laughs> she talked like this. It hurt. She was so tiny. Her feet didn't even touch the floor. And then when you got in there, I was, I could not stop looking at her library and famous postcards, you know, like to Louise, love Dan Flavin. You know, I was like, what? And so then I'd go to her bathroom downstairs and I'd stay in there for like an hour, like <laughs> looking at everything. And then I, and then they had this German woman film us and I called her the lady dominatrix. Because I'd say, can I look at that book? She goes, no, Lisa, no. Oh. Can I? No. <laughs> and did you start using binoculars after that? No. <laughs> <laughs> and see, then, what you, when you first got there, people, they bring out hard liquor and put it on the table with little shot glasses. I'm like, what? And then the, the, the lady dominator, I shouldn't call her, but she comes out and she goes, did you, who brought Louise her chocolate? You were supposed to bring her fine chocolates because she loves fine chocolates. I was like, oh my God, she's my kind of person. 
That's amazing. When I was like in my 20s, I used to go to New York, like a, some of my friends moved there after school. Um, I would go visit regularly. And I always like heard about those uh, Sunday salons and dreamed about going to them, but I had no idea how to make that happen. So cool that you got to go to them. I was working in a catering company too, and it was a fancy one. And um, the pastry chef's boyfriend worked at a gallery in Chelsea. And he came up, he made a studio visit to me. It was Bonham and oh, it was a really famous one. And so he came and, but he wasn't really high up, but he said, I want to come and visit your studio. So he did. And he's the one who gave me the invitation. He said, this is who you call. This is where you go. So I was like, I still have her phone number in my book. I'm going to keep it forever. So cool. Thank you. All right. Any last like arty questions? Yeah. <laughs> Lisa, thanks so much for sharing your work. I've, I've always enjoyed your work. It's, it's lovely. And Thank your you, ability with so many different styles and materials is inspiring. Um, I want to ask about Jean-Claude and, and uh, I just didn't know that you had spent time with them. And, uh -huh. and um, I learned so much. And Christelle. I mean, I learned... You know, it, it's interesting because they that neither of them are alive anymore, but they're right. They have huge projects that are still being finished, and I'm just so amazed that people can can have that much of a command of their work. Did you get a sense of what makes? Them oh yeah, I was right there when when we, they would have meetings with the guys that uh, got the fabric, and then the the meeting with the pe the people where the warehouse was, where we where where we built we prefab built the the, the things to be expanded you know so mm -hmm. I was just like whoa mm -hmm. and I, at first I didn't go because I told my girlfriend that I thought Krista was a has-been and that I was an artist too and that I wanted to sit on the beach with Patti LaBelle because Patti LaBelle was in our hotel <laughs> and I made friends with the piano player and I wanted to drink Cuban coffee and um sit on the beach and she'd say every day, are you sure you don't want to go? And I was like, well, okay. And then I was like, I never call anyone Hasbrin again. <laughs> 23 year old Hasbrin. But I mean, I couldn't believe, I learned so much about sculpture. It seemed like, you know, like this, this sculpture can be many things. And Jean-Claude did smoke. She was a smoker. <laughs> but it was like, it was incredible. It was uh, something I'll never forget when the night that it opened and all the art critics flew in from New York and see Miami Beach was still uh, uh, quaint and full of old people that pushed me out of line. When I would stand in line, this little old lady would push me out. I was like, that lady just... You just have to accept it, Lisa. This is their neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> was there any controversy? Like, was anybody complaining about yes, it? Yes, they uh, were complaining about the weave of the uh, material, whether or not the fish could uh, breathe. <laughs> and um, so we would have to say, yes, those fish can breathe. Because see, it's like this. See the, the little, uh, see how it, the water can go through it. Oh, see, that's what I always read. Like, there's always, like, people, the environmentalists are always, like, uh, yeah. doing it. So it's interesting to see it up close. Oh, we came home with so much pink fabric that we wrapped the entire yard and house. We had bundles on the plane, carrying it, putting it over storage. I have my t-shirt in there. Don't make me run and get it with a signature. We had t-shirts that said Surrounded Island, they were pink. We had a Willie Smith hat. It was really great. Cool. And he was really nice to talk to. Wow. And because I wasn't afraid of him, because I didn't I just asked him anything. <laughs> but now Andy Warhol, I, my, I was completely, I did not know what to say. I just was like, <gasps> Well, thank you so much for being our featured creative. Um, I want to give you another round of applause and then I'm going to turn off the recorder and then we can just have a party. So thank you so much, Lisa.
Thank you. Thank you guys.